Okay, well, let me move on to introduce our speakers for today. In fact, why don't you guys just come forward and um, I'll, I'll ask you to introduce yourselves, actually. So, who are you and where do you come from? Hello, I'm Davi, and uh, I come from two blocks from here where I live, just next door here in Aberdeen. So, I come from Slalom, but uh, I will talk about that very briefly during the presentation, I think. We'd yeah, like just, to just watch out for the disclaimer, exactly. because yeah. it's the most hideous thing I've ever seen. Um, it's important, our lawyers enforced us on that, but I'll talk about that in a moment, yes. Uh, hi, good afternoon. My name is Matt Loren. I am not from down the road. I'm, I'm from London. I've been with Slalom for three years, and I specialize in the retail sector um, and a practice area called customer engagement. Okay, good. And I've got one question to ask before we kick off. Why on earth did you choose from Catwalk to the reg as a subject? Well, it, it, it works well because we thought it was a good insight between the two industries. If it doesn't work well, it's Roger's fault. <laughs> so that's... He came with us, we were having a conversation, he said, okay. that's a great idea. So, okay. we take the credit if it works, if it's not, it's Roger. Okay, and Roger, you're, I'm going to have to ask you now, <laughs> why is this important? Well, it, when you look at our, our four focus areas, one of the key ones is knowledge transfer. And we're very good at the moment about talking about learning from other sectors, whether that's nuclear or automotive. Um, or the airline sector. And actually, when we had a cup of tea and, and we were just having a general catch-up and talking about some of the projects that Slalom are working on, um, you just start to think about, well, what's happening in a radically different sector and how they're communicating, um, exchanging information, and actually doing a lot of things in real time. So um, for, for us, this ticks a box with the, um, with the knowledge transfer side of things. To be convinced. <laughs> right, okay. Well, thanks very much, guys. I'm going to hand over to Davi and Matt, but over to you guys. Okay, so welcome, everyone. So I'm here and delighted to be here to talk about one, one particular idea we had that we think our industry in oil and gas can learn from the world of uh, fashion. And then first, when we came to the idea, a lot of people came to me, similar to Stevens, very skeptical. Why on earth are you picking these two industries? They're very, very different. I said, well, they're not that different. So if you think about both of our industries know the importance of dress well for the job. <laughs> we know we, have, we need to have the, dry, the right dress to go to work. But well, we won't be talking about that today. We're going to be talking, as Roger alluded to, on how we can collaborate better. But also, before we start, as Stephen mentioned, it's very important. I need you to all to have a look and this and make sure... <laughs> that you're comfortable with it. I need your nodding to say you agree with that. So is as bad as shells. <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it? Is it less orange, though? No. Let me take it back. I'm absolutely joking. There is no disclaimer whatsoever. We like to believe we are a bit different. It's Lalo. So there's no disclaimer. Ask any questions you want. Tweet and challenge us on any concept. There's no disclaimer. So we... Uh, um, as introducing myself, my name is David Quintieri, and together with Matt, we'll be delivering today's uh, session. So very briefly, Slalom is a, is a purpose-driven uh, consulting firm that helps companies solve business problems and, and build for the future. So you can find more about us and our 5,000 employees uh, in slalom.com. And uh, if you have more about Matt and I on LinkedIn, or you can follow us on Twitter. So as we... For today, we had this idea of uh, what could be different, but we want to have the right mindset as we present. So I would like to ask everyone to have this, game, this set of some game rules for the day. So when you think about three aspects, the first one, we call it the mirror. So let's be honest about where our industry is in terms of collaboration, how good or how bad we are. It feels like when you ask a room full of people uh, how you place your driving skills, usually 95% of the people said they are above average. And, and that's how I see sometimes the oil companies say, no, we are very good in collaborating, but the, the others don't. So let's be honest about what you do. The second concept is we call it the, the window. So let's look, look through the window to other places, like Roger was saying, let's look at nuclear, let's look at other industries, and let's be open about the new ideas. In today's world, I find sometimes people read a tweet, and based on a tweet, they are, have a full form position, they galvanize if, because they are against or in favor of something. I say, be open. Let's think first before you, we, we make up our minds. And finally, it's what we say, the moon. So let's aim high. So innovation happens when you we think about nearly impossible solutions. So this is where I would like to go for the moonshots. 
Reality will come at some point and will ground us. But until then, let's focus on the opportunity rather than the barriers. That's what I'm asking today for, for today's session. So to kick off, I would like to start with a myth. It's, it's a myth that I, we often hear, I think a lot of people in the room hear, that, that this industry is terrible at collaborating. Ladies and gentlemen, this industry is, if anything but that, this industry is awesome in coming together. So if you think about projects like uh, BP Sclare or, or, or Shell's Prelude, these are massive, remarkable projects that are delivered through strong collaboration with peers, partners, competitors that come together in the form of joint ventures. So we, we come together and we deliver these things quite well. But sometimes not so well, but most of the cases we deliver that very well. So we are good in collaborating. But for some reason, so we, we are good when we want to, but when it comes to the commission, for some reason, we, we, we don't. And God is thinking, why we don't do that? In the commission, we tend to go to the lunch and learns, the conferences and the, the, the magazines, and that those learnings happen when it's post the fact. It usually it's diluted. It's a great idea, but once it gets past the lawyers, you get very carefully, carefully review that something so generic, so vanilla, and so dated, that is of little value as a learning. So what, what we, we think is, is actually when you think about the main difficulty is not technical. The main challenge for the commission is not technical. It's actually human. It's getting the people to, to collaborate uh, uh, better. But none of that is new, right? I mean, uh, if you remember, I was Googling the other day and talking to, to Brian just now. Seven years ago, we were in Dunblain on the offshore decommissioning conference. And the title, I think, if I remember correctly, was uh, Collaboration in Action. And in every conference, every year, we talk about collaboration. I think in one of the conferences a couple of years ago, uh, Roger opened by saying, shall, we're not going to use the C word today, right? The C word that you shall not talk about. I'm afraid you failed miserably. Everyone was talking about collaboration. But we're trying to talk about collaboration. What if we do something a little different? What if we create a task force? What if the conference we put lessons learned first? Or in the lunch and learn, what if we serve a different food? Let's do something different to get the collaboration going. But it just feels that we are trying a variation of the same thing in trying to get to a different outcome. So we've been there before. I think we need to have to accept it's not working. So we thought about why it's not working. If we, we, if we, it works in, in, when we're developing new things. So we thought about what makes a difference. So in development, many differences, but two of them, you have a tangible price. If you're building Claire, you have your asset at the end. We know what we're trying to achieve together. There is an asset that will generate production, that will have a cash flow towards that. It's very tangible. Also, I know what I'm putting to this joint venture and what I'm getting back. I know exactly what each partner is bringing. I know what I'm putting, when I'm going to get back. When it comes to the commissioning, first, there's no tangible price for shared price. Because what I'm doing in my decommissioning product is very different than yours is there is no common, tangible goal for both of us. Second, the, it's not mutual. How can I guarantee what I'm putting to that collaboration I'm going to get back? And it's asynchronous. I may be helping you today and getting something back in a year from now, or at, never. So th these things won't change. So how can we walk away from, from, from that model? So We've been looking, as Roger said, we've been looking at the same industry. So we look at the nuclear, we look at demolition, you look at automotive, we look at aerospace more recently. And those are great industries, as you said, we are learning from them. But they tend to see similar industries than ours. So these are the industries that are capital intensive, asset based. And then they, are, they help us a lot of the technology challenges, but we are quite good on the technology side. We just, our problem is it's human. So it's time to look through a different window. So, that's why we're challenging. Well, let's look at uh, industries that are actually consumer-based. They are actually driving the transformation, not on the technical side, but they're driving the transformation on the human side. So, for a chance chat, when Roger was visiting our office in London <laughs> a few weeks back, and if you look very carefully, this is me here, by the way, and I work right here. So, we, we, we are talking about technology trends, and by the way, when you're in London next time, come visit us. It's a beautiful office by London Bridge. So we are talking about technology trends, what's happening out there. And it comes to that solution that we are doing for a, a, one of the world's leading fashion retailers, so high fashion. And then what we're helping them, and Matt is going to talk about that, what we're helping them is how to get the stores to collaborate to drive better sales. Actually, no. How do we, how do we help the people within the stores to collaborate, the sales personnel? 
which are typical people that don't really collaborate, but how to get the salespeople to collaborate in order to do that. So this is came, so the real question became, oh, but before I go to the real question, so what, 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 the idea is if I can push down collaboration to, from the company level to the human level, to the individual to individual. So if, what if it was peer to peer? Imagine if I could have people in the, in the Gulf of Mexico who comes to a different problem, and then I say, well, you know what? I can share that with my company. So my three years in the North Sea can take that, accept or maybe change that and modify a bit so someone in West of Africa picks that up. It, we can see that leading to safer, faster, cheaper decommissioning, which are the three things that we probably want to, want, most want to do. So the quick question then became, how can we take the learnings from one shop floor to the other shop floor? So then talking to, 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 to Matt, we're asking, Matt, what can you help us to take, what can we take from the store to the platform? Me, a little bit of uh, context in terms of the sector. Forgive me if, um, if those of you who know fashion, um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to simplify this greatly. So the t title of this uh, presentation is, you know, from the catwalk to the rig. And I think it's important because the catwalk is actually the backbone of the entire sales process for high-end designer brands, because that is where they showcase the items that they're going to be selling in a particular season, okay? So at the moment, you get high-end luxury brands selling for autumn, winter, um, for, for next season. Um, and the reason it starts there is because after they showcase those styles, what happens is there's this huge marketing and internal engine. So this is the corporate engine. They go down to each of the stores and they start teaching all of the sales associates. They helicopter in and they say, this is the reason why we chose this color. This is the reason why we chose this style. These are the types of people that you should be selling this type of um, uh, products to. Now, that's all well and good, except, as I mentioned, they helicopter in. They go into the store. They might send emails, you know, occasionally. But then the sales associates are left on their own. And the beauty of this is um, when the customer comes into the store, it's almost like that game plan almost goes out the window because the customers buy what they want, right? Customers buy what they buy. So the salesperson needs to adapt their sales pitch. They need to pick the right you know, combination of features. They need to understand the customer's intention, why they're wearing the clothes. And based on those interactions, they learn how to actually sell more. They learn how to sell better. Now, therein lies the opportunity. If one salesperson realizes that, you know what? <coughs> these pair of jeans actually goes really well with this wallet, and I've sold it five times, they should be selling, uh, telling that to all of their colleagues around the world so that they might be able to try that out and therefore improve their own personal performance as well as their store performance and ultimately the entire company's performance. That is the opportunity that um, our client um, is trying to capture by using technology. So they had an innovation program um, and what they wanted to do was, given the trends and given the age group of the employees, which are basically 18 to 35, they said, why can't we use social platforms like Instagram or YouTube or Facebook to actually um, redefine how uh, sales associates can actually communicate and share these best practices with each other? Um, and the one that they decided to develop was around an Instagram uh, idea. So this is basically the experience is I'm going to videotape my colleagues explaining how they actually are selling these blue jeans with these, you know, with this particular type of wallet so that I can instantly share that globally to um, other sales colleagues around the business. Now, if we just take a moment there, I think that is really, really powerful, right? If I put that um, in two words, I can explain that, that it's instant. And imagine 1,500 people around the world will be able to sell blue jeans and wallets that they wouldn't have been able to do using normal processes. 
And the normal processes I talk about here are, if I'm a sales associate, I'm in my store, I might share with my store. And that's great, the store benefits. Now, in order for, if my store is in that with a store in Hong Kong, there would probably be about trickle at some kind of meeting, and that might take months. So in order to sell that combination, which is selling right now, to get it over to the Hong Kong store, that might be very difficult, and you may have missed the window to maximize the value of that opportunity. So, but the, the purpose of this presentation is really, I want to share with you um, some of the uh, observations that I'm seeing since we've launched the pilot, or helped them launch the pilot of this application. The first one is this word behind me, which is viral. I'm starting to see videos here where uh, sales associates are saying, hey, I have this iPad in the store that no one uses. I'm going to actually take pictures of sunglasses and put them all in the photos uh, app of the iPad so that I, it very quickly I can actually look at the prices, the different styles of sunglasses I had. Seems like a no-brainer, right? But they don't necessarily have that tool. So they've actually created a tool. They've recorded them creating the tool and explained the benefits. And what I saw was this, a store in Vancouver basically said, oh, hey guys, I love that idea. I took that and I'm applying it not to sunglasses, but I'm applying it to accessories. So right there and then, and that was in a matter of those two stores have actually shared a, a key concept, but they've adapted it in a, in a different way. Um, the next one is collaborative. The app itself, of course, it allows you to create you know, vi videos of yourself and one person. However, what we started to see was actually they love making a production out of this. You know, two or three people in the store would actually stand around going, okay, who's the audience for this? What's the key message? How, okay, who's going to act? Who's going to hold the camera? And they would actually take the time to create a very high quality video because they know their audience. It's basically their peers. It's like-minded people like them. Um, so we're seeing collaboration and creating content. The, the word here, freedom, this is important because um, I think th this is more from a corporate point of view and how, they su how they're supporting this. There are two do's and two don'ts. That's all the rules they're giving them for this pilot at the moment. The two do's, two do's, are the first one is have fun and be creative. And the second one is just you know, all of the company policies around data and privacy and brand guidelines, that they all apply. So that shouldn't be, you know, it, it's a no-brainer. The last two are the two don'ts. And the first don't is really um, don't, sh you use this in front of customers, don't show customers because it's an internal app and you shouldn't be using iPhones on the floor. And the second one is really, if anything comes out of corporate centrally, don't copy it, don't try and make it better because it's, it's a top-down communication which is, which is formal. Um, and you might think that that's restrictive, however, they actually felt that that actually gave them freedom because, for example, um, the, the one example that they love to say during the training is they actually have videos and PowerPoint decks on how to actually wrap particular products when, like if I buy something from them, they have to wrap it in a certain way, the tape needs to go in a certain area, there are instructions for them. And they said, but you know, what you can do is actually say, you can actually make that process more efficient. So you can't tell people how, how to wrap it in a different way, but you can tell them how to make the process more efficient. For example, like, why don't you put multiple pieces of tape on your arm? That might save you a couple of minutes, for example. Very simplistic, but that resonated with people. And we're starting to see them um, create a lot of different types of videos. Um, so those are the three behavioral behavioral observations that I'm starting to have. But I think when, when you kind of look at it and you look at some of the research, and even in my own life, in our own lives, you'll start to see three other things. The first one is relevance. Um, and the reason I put this out there is because people listen to like-minded people. So for, you know, we, we all have groups, we all have interests, and if you, go to a, and you, if you want to know about something, you will go to a specific area that you trust, and, that, and you will listen to them. So similar in this case, it's basically sales per, salespeople making content for other salespeople. So they're more inclined to actually um, uh, listen to the content. And so the, the one video that I've seen here is, there's a lot of Chinese customers that actually visit these um, stores around the world. And one of the Chinese sales associates actually posted a video on how to say hello, thank you, this is the price. Very basic Chinese phrases so that everybody in the network can actually start applying that with their Chinese customers who visit. The other observation here, okay, this is a long one, you have to forgive me, is about, is about love. Now, you'll see here in this image, you know, these days, 
Everyone has a mobile phone. They're already starting to use social technology in a lot of different ways, okay? So this, is, this shouldn't have been a surprise to any of the users of this application. And the reason I put love here is because um, even people in their 70s, like my parents, God bless them, they are using at least three types of social networks. They've got Viber, they've got WeChat, and they have WhatsApp. They hate it. They don't like using that. But the reason why they're using that is because they love me, they love my brother, and those are the channels that we're using to communicate, right? So digital technology is here to stay. Social technology is here to stay, whether you like it or not, as, as users. And people do know how to use at least the basics. And the final thing here is tribal. Um, and this is really about, you know, once you're with a group of people, you end up forming your own rules, OK? But this is about self-regulation. Um, and I think that the best story that I'll probably end my discussion with is when I was training the users on the app, the first thing I wanted them to do was very simple. Go and click on your photo and upload a picture of yourself. And almost immediately, they all go, oh, uh, it's 9 in the morning, and uh, we're not dressed yet, so we're not allowed to actually put our picture up. Um, even on this app. So the monks themselves are like, ooh, we're not in black and white uniforms yet. We cannot, therefore, take a picture and put it on the app. And that's just one store. Um, and, and that's applying corporate regulations. So I've given you six principles or six human behavior observations that I'm already starting to see. And I want to hand over to Davi now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. And it's interesting, it got her thinking, if I, can I apply this behavior? Can, can I apply the technology that allows people to collaborate in the commissioning? So we're thinking is, can we reimagine now the commissioning where if I am in, within my company and I found something that I've done wrong or I've done right or I've learned something, instead of waiting for the end of the product to write a report and get this still down and then hit in six months time the, the, the Gulf of Mexico, what if I record right there? but not for my company, for my peers. I want to have my employees, my colleagues that are now in the West of Africa to think differently about that. And that for the reasons Matt said, it's easier. I, we speak the same language. It's not going to go up and down the organization. It's instant. We can do that globally. We can do that immediately. Then if you start to think about it, it doesn't have to be in the same company. What if we start to do that with different companies? So what if that network now has not only me in my oil and gas company in doing that, but I'm sharing learnings that other companies can pick it up instantly in an easy to use platform. When you're talking about Bomeyer, by the way, this is, of course there will be differences on how we're using what device we can use. It will probably be a desktop version of that, I can imagine. So I can go back to the office and write a longer report about the details, but I can also record and take a picture in some occasions. So it's a combination of different platforms, but the technology will sort it out. There will be a technology to share. But it's getting the move, the collaboration from the company to company that should collaborate but aren't, to the individual to the individual that are not expected to collaborate but will anyway if you allow them to. So if you all agree that the problem what is human, let's get the humans in charge of their collaboration. Okay? Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Davi and Matt. Thank you for that. A very interesting presentation. Lots of uh, uh, interesting parallels in terms of human behaviour and how we how we operate. And certainly good to see in an oil and gas discussion pictures other than platforms um, and other heavy machinery. So um, let's open to questions. I'm sure I'm sure there are a few questions about um, relevance, about behaviours, about culture. Anyone have a question? We'll pass a mic to you. Please say who you are and where you come from, and uh, we'll take it from there. Thanks. Tom Leeson from DCOM North Sea. Lovely. Really, really like that juxtaposition of the real contrast. Thank you. Um, quality assurance. How do you approach ensuring that what's transferred um, is... Valid. I'll take that one. So it's an interesting question because the client actually, um, it, it's a serious question. Um, and of course, and maybe in your sector, people, if you don't, people actually die, for example. I think that, in t oh, sorry, I know that's a really dark, dark thought. Um, I don't, please take that off of the video. Um, so um, I, I think two things. One is really around um, 
I think I'll quote uh, one of the sales directors. He basically said, but do they actually know all of the rules and policies? So it's nice to say that, yeah, tribal, they can actually self-regulate. Um, however, it's not going to do them any good unless if they're applying it the wrong way. So I think there needs to be an, uh, a framework of actually making sure that people understand what it is they can or cannot do. And I also think there's another kind of, I want to say it's probably the wrong word, but maybe moral or human instinct to actually post or not post something or do or not do something. Um, and I think those are the two things that I would respond to in, in terms of thinking that. Were there any specific examples that you see? Uh, no, I, well, I was asking the, the, the question that, um, in, in the wider context mm -hmm. um, that um, the, the assumption is that the person who's posting is competent yeah. to post. So how do we ensure that competency? Yeah. It's a very good question. Uh, and from, from, from oil and gas now hat, what you think is, uh, to, to, to two ways I, I, I approach that question. First is, your normal QAs you have in place today is not going away. So the same way that people submit the lessons learned to go to a report, someone is still re-verifying that report. What we're just doing is saving time and making that learning on the spot as close as when it happened. But there's still other people are, are seeing that, supervisors, other people are looking at the discussion and gonna say, but wait a second, that's not really how it should be done. Mm. And second, the flip side that we were talking about last night yeah. during dinner is, actually, if anything, you do better QA because I have many more people now looking at the learning on the spot. So maybe I have done something that I think it's right. I go to Brian and Brian think, actually, that looks right. But if I ask anyone else, it's not really right. The fact that I'm making it very public within the company mm. or within a set of groups, I'm increasing the QA capability because more people are looking at it quicker, yeah. more accessible. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. How is this done differently no. so that we don't keep ourselves in an old mindset? But how do we approach this differently so we actually achieve what we really want to do? No. Mm. You want to say? Oh, a couple of questions, yes. Yeah. Uh, my name is Stephen Ashley. I'm the Digital Transformation Solution Centre Manager here at the Oil and Gas Technology Centre. That's a mouthful. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, if you look at our, I'm talking about our industry and our industry being quite good at collaboration. Um, and look at knowledge management efforts. So quite a lot of our companies, BP, Slumberger, are recognized for some of their efforts around knowledge management and creating communities of practice. Of course, they're all internal. They're not shared across the industry, but they have pretty good um, you know, opportunities, and they're doing quite well. But one of the key aspects is how many people need to take part before you start seeing value and value-generated. Um, and I know there was quite a lot of research done in this area, but I was just interested in... What is the uptake and the usage given, you know, is it 10%, 20%? And at what point do you think is the real uh, tipping point in terms of generating value? So in, in, in the case of this particular app and this particular client, they just launched it, and that's a question that they had. It, it's a very okay. real one that they had up front. I've read the research submission very recently about that, and they claim 2.5% people are innovators, so about 12% early adopters, about 15% late adopters, and like I was Yes, and then, but I, 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 this is a, is a good study to see, and that applies to a lot of technologies, new technologies. I challenge that study for existing technologies. So I'll give you an example to answer your question how Starbucks is doing now with Workplace. I don't know if you guys know Workplace is Facebook's solution for collaboration within companies. So Facebook idea was, I don't have to teach anyone how to use Workplace. I've never seen it. It's a new product, but everyone knows how to use Facebook. So the uptake in, in, in Starbucks was almost 100% overnight. And I'll give an example how they already generate generating value. So when they launched the workplace, the first idea was the communication between leadership and the store managers across the US. And that worked very well. But they saw the, the store managers to create a separate community to share learnings within the store managers. And within very early on, someone posted a question in the morning saying, are you guys selling hot lemon and honey? Because we're selling about 15, 20 a day, and it's not in our menu. And then someone else, yes, apparently a celebrity put that in Instagram called like a Madison bomb. <laughs> I'm also selling 10, 15. And they realized within that day, talking about 24 hours, or eight hours working day, every store would say, yes, I have like five questions. But why this recipe? I don't know. Some people are using lime. Some people use lemon. And then this, the, the management team from, uh, from Starbucks realized, we are selling all these things that are out of our menu. 
By evening, they created a recipe. Next morning, every store in the U.S. had the original recipe for Starbucks, hot lemon and, and with honey. He was saying, the CEO presenting that, he says, we like to believe you're a very agile company. In most places, it will take a long time. For us, it will take weeks, maybe a month, from an idea to a recipe on the store. With that, it took 24 hours. So it's just, again, they had the channels to do the communication before, but the store manager would have to submit formally through a SharePoint, through a document, to go to head office, to come down. And this was the store managers bubbling up. So I think that the uptake can be a lot quicker because people are already doing that in their personal life, how they're sharing things. I think there's a question here in the front from Wynn. No. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Wynn Thornton with BP and from Texas, I guess. <laughs> uh, for me, interesting premise. Uh, for me, corporations in the space are paranoid and stingy. So we're not very good at sharing or collaborating, <laughs> to be truthful. Uh, to me, the human to human is interesting. Uh, I was here in an event for OGTC around decommissioning. Willem and I and a couple of our peers were talking about projects that were currently happening. Pull up an iPhone, share a picture, up to date what's, what was happening there. It was very uh, powerful to see what was happening in three projects right there. If we could do that day in and day out, real time, again, from engineer to engineer, project manager, project manager, immense value. I can really see something in the decommissioning state space for this, practitioner to practitioner. I, I, I fully agree. And actually, what, 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 this is oil and gas, but specific for decommissioning, also true is we are in a cost game, right? We all know in decommissioning, we're in a cost game. And the fact is, any collaboration across company, or even within company, yours we, we, one example, regions can use different systems. Companies use very much different systems. But if you have a platform that's cloud-based, easy to use in tablets, mobile, desktop, then you instantly have everyone in the same platform. So your cost is minimal. You set up this application, it goes viral. Your marginal cost for Nux to use it is virtually zero. So the, the uptake can be very cheap as well. Yeah, and I think you know, sharing amongst your peers, I'm not going to put anything out there that's not very well baked or well enough to challenge me. So I think it's self-policing. In fact, yeah. the challenge may be we're trying to one-up each other with, uh, I've saved money doing this. It's lesson learned. It's a great, uh, great premise, engineer to engineer. You know, Forget the human to human part. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, Willem from uh, Wood. I wanted to ask one question. So I've, I've come to realize over the years that we're very good at sharing successes, but we're hopeless at sharing how not to do things. And I was wondering if you had any insights from the other industry as to how not to sell things that we might be able to learn something from, because those are the key ones where we could really learn and save money, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take one from, 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 from the example of Starbucks before Matt talks about in fashion. I think the, the difference there is because if I am sharing to the corporation, I am an engineer, some, sometimes an engineer and a human, I, if I'm sharing the corporation, I need to be careful because my corporation is my superiors. It, it's, I'm, to, I, I may, I, I'm, I'm sharing with my, 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 my employer. If I share with my peer, it's different. So I'm more likely to share something that I don't know if it's right. I'm just checking. So I'm doing this. I thought it was a better idea. What do you think? I don't want to talk that necessarily to my supervisor because if it's a good idea, great. If it's not, I'm going to say I, I thought something wrong. So what we see in other industries is people are much more likely to share the lessons, the hard lessons, which are not only the successes, if they are sharing across peers, not necessarily sharing with, uh, with their employers. I don't know if that's what you've seen as well. I'm curious if you had a, an app that would allow people to do that, because there's a valuable one. So here's, here we can say, don't try that. I guess my question is, I mean, why couldn't you use a similar app and just say, it's OK to actually talk about mistakes and communicate it the right way? It's kind of just this, this is how I think. And I think that's the beauty of a platform maybe like video that richness, and you can actually tell that story. Thanks. Ian Broadbent from Robert Gordon University. Um, I think it's, no, uh, it's not a coincidence that one of the most successful fashion re retailers is uh, Zara, and they were early adopters of um, IT and uh, sharing uh, technology. Their mantra is, one hand on the customer, one hand on the factory. 
And what their, um, their network of their uh, sales force and their managers ensures this exquisite sensitivity to what the customer needs. So they've, they you know, automatically in, in, increases their, their revenue. But the other thing that it enables them to do is minimize inventory costs, drive down the, the uh, amount of uh, spare stock that they're, uh, they're, they're carrying. Uh, it's just a, a comment that I don't think it's any, um, any coincidence that they were early adopters of this sort of approach. Actually, if I... Application was supposed to be around how to actually get people to sell more and, and sell better. They have, they also want to extend to people in, in the back room. I think one story is really helpful about this. Please thank. Um, Non-transparent um, suit carriers, and of course, if you're a sales associate and you go back there, you're like okay, where's that dress again? And you gotta open it up and you might even snag something. And using um, a platform like this, people actually would say, you know what? What we did was we actually bought clear plastic suit carriers from Amazon and we've replaced everything. Um, and now that solves that problem. So that's a back office application, but using this type of technology to communicate. Yeah, and, and I love that example because you think it's something that you th imagine, of course we use transparent plastic, but no, they aren't. And this is a, a, a world, one of the world leaders, fashion retailers. And probably if you get them to look what we're doing in the commission, they're gonna say, really, you're doing that? So I think when you are embedded into the, your work, you don't see these obvious things. And then this is, a, I, I love the example on, on, on how to get that uh, across. Hi, John Hunter from Tendeka. Um, I was just wondering what you, as, as the company's role was in this, uh, the story you've painted of a fashion company, how you help them. Um, I guess it's not that you've just observed it. You, you and your company must have been involved in this journey somewhere. I'll let you, the, the product lead. It's what, what was your role within the, uh, the fashion story, the fashion company story oh, okay. that you painted? How did your company help them and support them? Thanks for asking. Um, so basically it was, it was pretty much end-to-end. -end. They um, admittedly had an innovation process and had their own idea. They had an inkling of, you know what, we actually want to use something like Instagram to help people to communicate in this way. Um, and, but they said, we, we, need to, we need your help to actually help us pitch this and understand how it might, you know, how much it might cost, what's the investment like in order to develop this type of solution. So we helped them to develop the vision through a discovery phase. They got the funding. We helped them, we actually developed the app for them. And now at the moment, I'm supporting the rollout and adoption within the pilot stores. Um, and some, you know, the observations here, I'm collecting those so that when they do want to roll out globally, they can take those. So, we're just enabling them to do what it is they want to do. University. Um, how do you break the ice? I mean, how do you convince early adopters to be starting? Do you tell them you're the pilot store, so you have to go for it? You have to do like 10 Instagram posts this week? So that's actually, that's, we're going through those same discussions now. I think the most important thing uh, for the pilot that we learned is that you have to pick the right store. So we actually sat with the sales directors for different regions and we said, we need these, we think that we need these types of people. Do you have any stores that would actually fit this bill who would actually proactively um, share best practice, you know, create a structured way around creating this through the pilot period. So we, we set a framework, but we had to work with the business, and they actually did come up with, in my opinion, the right um, store to actually start with, because what that does, it, it overcomes the, oh my God, do we have to run a competition? Do we have to force them to actually create videos? So it's, it's about choosing the right people when you start, who will actually be self-starters and proactively do that. Um, at the same time, I think it's also, you do need to be prepared, especially when you put it out to more stores. What happens if you don't get stores who are actually, you know, putting stuff up? Um, and there are two ways to actually look at that as I'm thinking through this, because um, one is, yes, you, you might need to kind of prod or give them a little bit um, more of a nurturing and caring. But at the same time, you also need to look at how they're using the app. So just because no one's posting, it doesn't mean they're not getting value from the app, which is another important thing. So we're using data analytics to actually see, is at least every single user logging in a certain amount of time? Because if they're logging in and they're flipping through it, then they're probably looking through videos and they're picking up something, which therefore means that there's a propensity that they might click on something and therefore learn something. So. Um, that probably a good point to reinforce is when they post, it's also about who's watching it and what, what are they doing with the app. How do we ensure it's not exponentially becoming a huge mess on the platform, like uh, everybody talking about everything? Mm -hmm. How do you structure this? Have, have you planned to do this at some point? Or? 
so we we spoke to the executive team, and I think the feeling there is, you know, let them, at least for the pilot, let them post what they want. They believe that the platform using social media, you know, best practices, let the users actually self-regulate. If there's a video that's up there, as long as it's not completely wrong, let it stay. And they basically said they want to be in the position where they're saying, you know what, if no one likes the video, no one's going to watch it. It's going to end up at the bottom of the feed anyway. So they've self-regulated what they feel is important. Yeah, at the moment, in terms of the, the minimal viable product, it's really just one single feed where videos are coming in. Um. And just to build on that, if the, the concept of the MVP, so the minimal viable product, is very important on these things, especially when you're doing it on a, on a, on a cloud-based, on, on an app like this. Because quite often, especially in our industry, we're very used to waterfall. That's plain for everything. What's going to happen if the users do this, X and Y, two years from now, three years from now, and make an investment? The reality is, with a lot of these questions, we don't really know. And that's okay. So let's plan so what, when the rollout for workplace in Starbucks. They never thought about creating a community for the store managers. It was just between headquarters and the stores. And then happened. Now let's work around. What can we do about that? How can we maximize that? So it's also be prepared to be agile. And then you're going to have different sprints when you, you get a new idea and you work towards that, rather than spending 18 months planning, planning by the time you let's launch is also the, is, is an old idea, it's an old, old concept. So just be prepared to be adaptive. And do that. Quick question on content. I mean, how, how many users in your pilot? How many entries a day? Just to get wide. Yeah, so um, we just started rolling out into the pilots. The intention is about 65 users using it over two months. Um, and we set up... Uh, a very, very low bar in terms of videos. So basically, they're looking at a success factor of um, 50 videos uploaded, um, and then maybe a user, a daily user engagement rate of like 20%. So basically, someone just has to log in and touch a, any screen on the app, and, and we consider that an engagement. So, but I think based on when we started, I've already seen 18 videos go up, and that's just with one store. And so the next two stores are next week, and that's in North America. And fingers crossed, I'm hoping that they'll just, you know, fish to water, things will just start populating. Um, and then uh, in Asia, there's two stores um, that they're going to be launching in about three weeks' time. Yes. Hi, I'm Javier from Thermos One. Um, my question is, how do you keep people motivated to keep posting videos? And now, this is a great question, and I think this is also, I, I think this is where the top-down model might actually fall down. I think that when you talk about these types of users, the, if you really, at least in the clients that I've worked with, and there's two luxury clients I've worked with, the actual power in terms of teaching or telling people what to do, it rests with the store director. Okay, it rests within the store. It doesn't rest with the CEO, and they recognize this, or even the brand team. The, so therefore, in order to make sure that people post or post the right things, you really need to go through the right mouthpiece within the store, um, and then hopefully that will make sure every single other store will actually do the right thing. Um, and then also there's the, the re-emphasis of policies. Um. And one thing as well, in terms of, we also have to remember the human nature that we want to share. If you go back and see when Wikipedia was launched, the number of papers saying how utterly fail, failure Wikipedia would be, because why would I share content for free? Yeah. And if you think about Amazon reviews, why people go to Amazon and review a product? They're not getting paid to do that, and they get multiple things. Think about the forum, the technical forum. Go to Apple technical forum. Most questions addressed to Apple are not answered by Apple. Are answered by users of Apple are very gladly just to go there for free and say because they want to share. Yeah. So people, I mean, we, we look about in developing. So we do a lot of code in slalom and building apps. We think we, a lot of our developers, they get paid to code during the day. And then they go at the home in the evening and they code for free. Because <laughs> they want to. No one is forcing them. So the fact that they're putting a code up there that someone else is liking, number of likes. So just think about, I gave you that idea about the sunglasses uh, to, in one store. To see that someone in Toronto, and here in Hong Kong, I created the idea someone in Toronto is using it successfully, makes me feel good. And that is something that sometimes we neglect, but it's a very powerful thing that the humans, by nature, want to share. I don't want to share with my employer, with a big corporation, if I have to fill forms, if I have to go through a Salesforce screen that takes three seconds every time I click. But if it's something that I'm used to, oh, I'll share. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think oh. we're going to cut off, actually. I'm going to be quite strict. Oh. 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 Life's to lead. 
Um, so thank you to Davi and Matt for your very interesting presentation. I think uh, we'll just give them a, the usual sort of appreciation, shall we? Thank you very much. <laughs>